an evangelical is about to make an appeal to the thief on the cross in a baptism argument. <laughs> What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I am always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. In this episode, we're talking about baptism. I know I've already done an episode on baptism that it is necessary for salvation, but today we're going to paint a picture of baptism. I'm I'm an, I'm an artist. I, I'm a painter. Well, I used to be. Uh, back when I had more time and more resources, I used to be a painter. Uh, and I used to love to paint a picture that would tell a story. And so what I want to do, not with, not with oils or brushes, but with only the Word of God, I want to paint a picture of baptism. Now, there was a, a, a picture shared on Facebook this morning by a friend Quoting, no commentary, just quoting 1 Peter 3.21. Baptism now saves you. And the thread is, is still going on. It was, this was this morning when I got out of bed, and it is still going on. And I'm amazed that nobody is looking at this and going, well, you know, that verse doesn't say what it sounds like. It says, because X, Y, Z. They were saying, baptism doesn't save. You can't say be saved by water. Jesus saves. Only Jesus saves. Only faith in Christ alone saves. Uh, water doesn't save. Only the shed blood of Christ saves. Stop. You're not exegeting 1 Peter 3.21. What is exegete? That's a big theological term. It means to draw out of the text that which it says so clearly. You're not drawing out of 1 Peter 3.21, and there's a beautiful sentence diagram. Guys, remember sentence diagrams? That dissects 1 Peter 3.21 that shows us it is actually saying, yes, baptism now saves you. Baptism doesn't save you because it's, it's a, like a bath, like you're washing water, dirt away from your body. It, 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 baptism, is an appeal to God for a clean conscience. It is, a baptism is the pledge of a clean conscience to God, depending on the translation that you're looking at. So grammatically, baptism being the pledge of a good conscience is the thing that saves you, not by washing dirt away from your body, but it, baptism, saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what the verse clearly says. It, it's, Literally the one verse in the Bible that mainline American Protestants, non-denominationals, and evangelicals just don't know exists. So I want to paint a picture. Join, we'll, we'll get the canvas up, we'll use the Word of God, and we'll paint a picture of baptism, not with oils, but with the Word of God. And the challenge being to the evangelical. Don't come at me with a straw man argument like the thief on the cross or only the blood of Jesus saves or only Jesus saves or faith alone saves. Don't come at me with any of that. We're just going to speak the word of God to paint a clear picture of what the Bible says baptism is. The, the thing that astounded me about this thread is that these people were going to every verse in the Bible that's not about baptism to destroy every verse in the Bible that is. So it's a weird hermeneutic. It's a weird principle or method of interpretation. So we're just going to read the Bible to paint a picture. So we're going to make multiple strokes on our canvas, and we're going to paint a picture of baptism. Acts 2.38, verse through 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Are you seeing the picture? So with a few strokes of the word of God, what do we know? What can we see as we paint this picture of baptism? It is 
for the forgiveness of sins. It gives you the Holy Spirit. It's for children. It's a promise. See, I said to someone, baptism is a promise, a la Acts 2.38. They said, no, it's an act of obedience. Well, hold on a minute. Let me do a quick um, a quick search here. Um, BibleGateway.com. Act of obedience. No results. All right, all right, all right. Hold on here. here. Uh, baptism now saves you. Oh, look at that. There's a verse for that. It's that easy, guys. Um, so <laughs> we're painting a picture of baptism using only the word of God. And we already know that baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. It's a promise. It's for children. It's for everyone, as a matter of fact. And it gives the Holy Spirit. Romans 6, 3 through 5. Do you not know that all of us who have found the bad tongues of angels? I say that joke a lot. If you don't get it, uh, here's a link. <laughs> Sorry. Here's a link uh, to, <laughs> to the video where I, the tongues of angels. Okay. It's another way that I mock evangelicals. Well, charismatics. So Romans 6, 3 through 5. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Baptism gives you the Holy Spirit. Baptism is a promise. Baptism is for children. Baptism buries you with Christ into his death and raises you to newness of life by the power of his resurrection. As 1 Peter 3.21, the verse in question on the, the, this thread stated, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.11, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, circumcision is an old covenant thing. Circumcision uh, was a covenant of God that on the eighth day you would remove the foreskin from the boys, and that was God's covenant. The foreskin is removed. They are a part of his covenant. They are children of God. Circumcision, now being compared to baptism in the New Testament, baptism is the circumcision of Christ. So whose work is baptism? See, remember, I was told baptism is an act of obedience. There it is again, so strong. By the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which in which is in reference to what? Baptism. You were also raised with him through faith by the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So whose work is baptism? So baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. It gives the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. It's for everyone, even children. It buries us with Christ and raises us to newness of life. And it is Christ's circumcision made without human hands that buries us with him into his death and by the working of God raises us to newness of life. So whose work is baptism? We're getting a very clear picture of baptism here. I see nothing about a thief on the cross. Isn't that amazing? I see nothing about only the blood of Jesus. <laughs> or only grace alone. Oh, hallelujah. Or only faith alone. <clears throat> I'm just seeing what the Bible actually says about baptism. It's interesting how these people will go to every verse that's not about baptism. And then when you bring up the verses that are about baptism, well, I mean, <sighs> I can't even deal with that verse, Ryan. I can't even, I can't even, how dare you even bring that verse up. Linda, Linda, listen, 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 you. listen, Linda, listen. I literally can't even, Ryan, with you because my traditions of men.
Because we all know Christianity didn't truly exist until my pastor got a degree in theology from the University of Phoenix online, and now he knows everything about Christianity. That's when Christianity started, Ryan. Sheesh. Acts 22.16 Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Now, this is incredible because Paul was on the road to Damascus to destroy the church. And Jesus appeared to him in a blinding flash of light, throwing him from his horse, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul, blinded, <laughs> blinded by the light, um, <laughs> um, he's laying there blind. And God calls Ananias to him. And Ananias says to him, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name washing away of sins is the first thing Paul was ever told about baptism. And later, when he gives off the list of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God, he doesn't say, but you gave your heart to Jesus, but you prayed the sinner's prayer, but you asked Jesus into your heart. He says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. All these ED words, things that happened to you. You don't deserve to go to heaven because X, Y, Z, Paul says. But you were washed, you were baptized, you were sanctified, you were justified. These are all things, these are all the powerful work of God because baptism is God's work, not ours. All I'm doing is laying out what the scripture says and saying the same thing. The scripture says, in the same language that the scripture says it. Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Ryan, that verse isn't about baptism. We're going to get there. It actually is. And we're going to turn to the earliest Christians from the first and second century, or from the second and third centuries, to find out the language that they used when they wrote about baptism and see that it's drawn directly from Titus 3. Titus 3 is about baptism. So it's a washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom's poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, so that being justified, being declared righteous. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. Baptism is an act of obedience. <coughs> <coughs> Not because of works done by us in righteousness. Baptism surely is a work but it's Christ's work, as Colossians so clearly put it. 1 Peter 3.21, the verse in question on this initial Facebook post, baptism, which corresponds to this, the, the flood of Noah, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Baptism now saves you. How? Because it, baptism, is an appeal to God for a clean conscience. Because it, baptism, saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is this not what Paul says in Romans or Colossians? Baptism saves us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' own words in John 3, 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And if you want more on that, I've got this video for you. Baptism is necessary for salvation. Are you starting to see the picture that the Bible is painting? When we look at the verses that are strictly and staunchly about baptism, paints a beautiful picture of what baptism is. I didn't read anything that says it's an act of obedience. I didn't read anything that says it's an outward sign of an inward reality. I didn't read anything 
that says that it's only for those who are of the age of accountability. That's not the picture of baptism that the Bible paints. It is for the forgiveness of sins. It is a promise. It is for children. It gives the Holy Spirit. It buries us with Christ into his death and raises us with him to newness of life as God's work. And actually, baptism saves because Jesus says so. In Ephesians 5, we read that baptism is how Jesus sanctifies his church, his bride, having sanctified her by the washing of water with the word. Now, one of the challenges this morning was water can't save you. Literally, nobody said that, okay? What we're saying is Jesus says water and his word sanctifies. Paul says baptism, water baptism, buries you with Christ into his death and raises you again to newness of life. It's the new circumcision done without hands because it's God's work. So it's not anything that we do. It's what God is doing in us through Christ. When we look to the verses that are about baptism, they paint a very different picture, this beautiful, beautiful picture that we now have of baptism from the word of God alone, from verses that are staunchly about baptism. We haven't read about the thief on the cross. That's a big straw man. And they went there. They always go there. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized. You don't know that. Prove to me from scripture alone that the thief on the cross wasn't baptized by John in the Jordan River. I'm, I'm waiting. Oh, you can't? This time you're not going to make an argument from silence? Okay. So that's a, that's a straw man argument. And drawing from Peter's words in... In the book of Acts and in his epistle, uh, baptism now saves you, the pledge of a clean conscience towards God. And in Acts, where he says it's a promise, what did the thief on the cross in his very unique circumstance receive? A promise today, you will be with me in paradise. That's the same promise of holy baptism. Today, you will be with me in paradise. It's, it amazes me that all of these clear passages of Scripture well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. Okay, so now the exception redefines the norm. Look, there are exceptions all over the New Testament, but that doesn't mean 1 Peter 3.21 is not true, that baptism saves as an appeal to God for a clean conscience by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It doesn't, that thief on the cross or the eunuch who believed and was baptized, or the jailer who believed and was baptized. Look, did, did, are you noticing a pattern? Once these people believed, they were baptized. And uh, there's a really good book on the topic. Here's a picture. Um, I don't have it in front of me. Read it. Even babies in the first four centuries were baptized, as Peter said, the promise being for you and for your children. Ryan, you said you were going to get to Titus. All right, I'll get there. Let's do some scrolling. And this document that I'm looking at, I'm going to put down... Uh, <laughs> In, in the, the link, I'm going to link it below uh, because it's a beautiful, beautiful comment. So we're going to Titus 3, 4 through 7, uh, how the earliest Christians understood this text. Christians have books upon books upon books on their shelves. Christians love to read books, but all of a sudden you bring out a book written in the, in the first couple centuries of the church. Ah, traditions of men. Really? How is that any different from your everyday a Friday book or your idiot Jesus calling book? How is that any different, except for the fact that it actually aligns with what Scripture said and was written by people who knew the apostles personally? So, uh, Theophilus of Antioch writing to Autolycus uh, in 181 AD, uh, using the language of Titus 3 to describe baptism. Moreover, Theophilus of Antioch says, those things which were created from the water were blessed by God, so that this might also be a sign that went men the tongues of angels. Let's do that again. <laughs> Moreover, those things which were created from the waters were blessed by God, so that this might be tongues of angels. <laughs> Moreover, those things which were created from the waters were blessed by God so that this might also be a sign that men would at a future time receive repentance and remission of sins through water and the bath of regeneration. All who proceed to the truth and are born again and receive a blessing from God. Written in 181 AD, talking about actually the waters of creation and all 
those things which were created from the waters were blessed by God so that this might also be a sign that men would at a future time receive repentance and remission of sins through water and the bath of regeneration. This is why uh, in 1 Peter 3.21, in from the Greek to the English, Peter compares the flood. It says the flood is an antitype of baptism. When God created, he drew out of the water the dry land. When God destroyed, he submerged everything under the water and drew it back out again. This symbolizes baptism, which now saves you. 1 Peter 3.21 says. Amazing. Uh, uh, one more. Uh, Clement of Alexandria uh, in uh, 191 AD. When we are baptized, we are enlightened. Being enlightened, we are adopted as sons. Adopted as sons, we are made perfect. Made perfect, we become immortal. And the sons of the Most High. This work is variously called grace. Illumination, perfection, and washing. It is a washing by which we are cleansed of sin, a gift of grace by which the punishment due our sins are remitted. Illumination by which we behold the holy light of salvation. Now, these were written in the second century AD. They were talking about baptism and they were using the language of Titus 3 to describe baptism, a washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, these quotes from the early church fathers aren't authoritative and doctrine-forming like the scriptures, but they say the same thing. And that's the point. I'm not making an appeal to authority. What in the what? Can it be winter already so you die? I'm not using the early church fathers as an appeal to authority like Rome does. What I'm saying is, here's what the Bible says. Here's what it says in plain language. Here's what it means. Oh, and by the way, here's how we know that's what it means. Because look, the earliest Christian said that's what it meant. So this, <laughs> can, can, we, can we hear that, that uh, appeal to the thief on the cross one more time? Let's close this out. Look, so when the Bible says baptism save, it's saves, it's not saying we're justified by grace through faith alone. It's, it's not saying we're not justified. We certainly are justified by grace through faith alone. Because baptism gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works faith through the word of God. It's faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And those words, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that you are baptized into, those are the words of God. Christ. And baptism being Christ's work because it is him sanctifying his church by water and the word. So to, to say baptism saves is absolutely true. It doesn't mean we're saying Jesus doesn't save. Jesus does save. He saves by the preached word. He saves by baptism because he says so much. And because the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, came to the apostles who wrote the New Testament to tell them to say everything that baptism is so that we can have a sure promise and a sure foundation. I used to trust back in the day in my decision that I made for the Lord, but then I went out and I'd remake a decision for the Lord, and that was my new day of salvation. How stupid. I had no hope. Now I have a hope. I'm baptized. I've been sanctified by Jesus' own washing with water and the word. And Jesus said on the night that he was betrayed, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Only the shed blood of Jesus saves. You know, you know when, when I hear an evangelical say that when we're talking about baptism, I want to say, you know what? The blood of Jesus does save. Where can I get it? How do I get it? How do I bathe myself? How do I wash my robes white? In the blood of the Lamb. How, where is this blood? Let me have it. Let his blood be on me and upon my children. Where is this blood? I need it. <laughs> oh, oh, Jesus says you're washed in his blood as a promise when you believe. Okay, cool. So Jesus can make a promise about something and it holds true? Well, Jesus said baptism now saves you. Jesus said, uh, unless I wash you, have you, no, you have no part with me. Jesus said, you must be born of water and the Spirit. 
There is a way which we can access this blood of Christ. Paul says in Corinthians, do you not know that the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a part? That's not, that's not the exact, I'm confusing it. Uh, the cup of blessing which we bless, Paul says, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Yes, actually, Christ does give us his very blood. And for the same purpose, the forgiveness of sins. So yes, the shed blood of Christ does save. Yes, Jesus saves. Yes, faith alone saves. Yes, grace alone saves. Baptism being the definition of grace because it's not a work done by us in righteousness, but it is the powerful working of God and one that we don't deserve and one that we can't ask for and one that we can't do ourselves. God has to do it to us. Jesus has to sanctify us by the washing of water with the word. This is the language of the Bible as it has been clearly presented. This is the beautiful painting of baptism that we get from the beautiful, beautiful pigments of the Word of God. If you think I'm wrong, I am a man and I can err. I'm a man and I can err. But let my error be proven by Scripture. Okay? So if you think I'm wrong, if you think baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality, meet me in the comment section. Guys, when you leave me a comment and you ask me a question or you challenge something that I believe, I love it. It's my favorite. I love talking to you guys. I'm talking to a camera right now. I love talking to you guys. Meet me down in the comment section. We'll hash this out. Until next time, may God richly bless you. And the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.